So Claire, why is Seed Savers important? Well, as I say, this is, we're standing here in a living library that is actually the genetic heritage, the collective genet genetic heritage of Ireland is right here. It's probably the area of most biodiversity in the whole island of Ireland now. Um, when the seed savers began here in the 1990s, it trawled the seed banks of the world for particularly Irish seeds. And as far away as St. Petersburg, former Leningrad, we found like the Irish green pea that had been saved by Nikolai Vavilov, the famous Russian scientist in the 1920s. And so we're now growing them out here for the future. Basically, Duncan, if, if we had had this seed bank here in the 1840s in Ireland, nobody would have starved because one of the things that has happened with the food, global food system now, is that we're increasingly going into monocultures, growing the same variety with no genetic variation. And that was very dangerous for us in the 1840s. We were only growing one variety of potato, predominantly the lumper variety, which we still grow here in seed savers. In fact, it's not a very nice potato, apparently. But there, the, the, in Peru, in the Andes, where the potato originated, the farmer would have been growing at least 200 per field, 200 varieties of potato per field, out of a community resource of about 2,000. So genetic variability and seed variety stands between us and mass starvation, basically. And all of the leading scientists are saying that now. So that's what concerns us. And that is actually not just about seed security and food security, but it is about seed sovereignty and food sovereignty. That we are, as sovereign peoples can actually grow what is adapted locally, best locally to this area, um, but we're actually saving it for the world as well because we're finding seeds now that are from other places but that actually grow well in Ireland too. So are we now on a pathway towards total unsustainability with very few types of varieties? You know, supermarkets are concentrating on very few different species. You know, big intensive monoculture farming. Mm. Are we heading down a very, very dangerous track? Well, I think we are, Duncan, in one sense, and this is why places like this are, have become and are, will become increasingly more important. Because the one-size-fits-all thing is really dangerous, that there is a particular technological, you know, solution, or that there's one seed that's going to actually fix it. And What's dangerous about that? Well, it's very dangerous, and this is what I'm interested in, is the power and control and the increased monopolies of certain seed companies, like three companies on the planet, now control 90% of the grain supply globally. That's really dangerous because this is about the food we eat, that we all eat, and we need very wide varieties of, of a huge variety of genetic variability in our seed populations to actually increase our resistance and resilience as we face climate change. And I'm particularly looking at sub-Saharan Africa, where we have the people right in the front line of climate change who now all of the scientific journals are really suggesting that what they mainly need these small holder farmers is to continue to be able to grow as many varieties as possible that is the best very that is the best buffer against climatic change and have you seen these farmers in action in these countries absolutely what is incredible in ethiopia particularly which is one of the areas that i'm particularly looking at i've met farmers in the field who are growing up to 111 different varieties of barley up into gray in the highlands they need to because that's the best chance that they have against famine. So we need to be able to in, in, ensure that the dominant narrative of, of a kind of a, an economic agenda, a market-led, you know, technological agenda is not actually going to help these people. It's, they actually need to have, um, to be encouraged and an enhancement of the varieties that they're already growing, because in fact, they are doing very well considering. And if we look at the coming down the track in the future, we're going to possibly have nine and a half billion by 2050 on the planet. Mm. And we've got impacts of climate change with droughts and, you know, heat waves, all these, these impacts. Mm. Are we going to be able to feed the people of the planet? Well, that is the, the big question for us. But what I suppose what we in political science are certainly looking at is the fact that you, there are many narratives out there that are worth listening to and that we must not go down a one narrow 
technological solution. It simply will not work. And that's why the work of seed sovereignty movements and food sovereignty movements is now becoming actually centre stage because they're, they're actually saying we need to have a little bit of humility that the farmers who, who grow food, one billion of them actually, still produce 70% of the food on the planet. They know a thing or two. And so when I met like the, the one of the leading biodiversity experts on the planet, in fact, in Ethiopia, where they have considerable, 98% of their food is still grown in open indigenous, open pollinated varieties of seed and huge diversity. And they're actually saying, we need to be able to continue this germplasm exchange. We need to be able to, to continue to have a very rich agrobiodiversity because that is the best chance that we have in fighting climate change. And if we care with the population of the world, possibly reaching around nine and a half billion by 2050 and with the impacts of climate change coming down on us very quickly how is this going to affect food production and will we be able to feed that huge number of people on the planet well you see that is such a central question Duncan that's why we need to actually be very very careful about how we answer it and I think it's hugely important that we maintain the idea of access and entitlement is well considered across the planet to be the most important thing to save people from famines. I mean, we know that like in, in, over the last number of decades, that was actually, like they say, famines don't happen in democracies. That sometimes we think that a famine is because the seeds have failed or whatever, but uh, oftentimes it's the political and social and economic conditions that make famine possible. We know that the salutary lesson from our own country wasn't just the agricultural threat of, you know, a monoculture crop of just one variety of potato being grown, but it was also the political conditions. So rights are inc incredibly important in relation to this. Even in Ireland, I think in the future, this seed bank here and this living library that we're standing in here will become very, very important to people. And um, because we will be looking for the alternatives. We will be looking for crops, seeds, seeds which are food of course, we will be looking for seeds that have been adapting in the natural environment as changing climates happen and we will be looking for seeds that are resilient and we will need people who are resilient too and we know that so we actually what we're doing here I think if we're talking about reimagining the Republic coming to the century teenery we're coming to it wouldn't be a bad place to start in the kitchens and in the food and in the fields of Ireland with our seeds a collective heritage here of the Irish people that was lost to us actually through our own you know sad and very very um, difficult periods in our own history we have now got here a restoration project a conservation project for the future posterity of the children of this nation that is not just a national issue though it links us from the local to the global of a solidarity movement for food and seed sovereignty for the future